The Clock of Saint-Germain, read and written by Christopher Halton. As a writer and an acknowledged antiquary on the subject of historical esoteric items, I am often called privately to view rarely seen gems from antiquity, and I must add, from some of the most obscurest and remotest of places, where these items of varied interest have slumbered quietly through the long centuries. In most cases, I have bought and added these to my collection. Among these artifacts, I have housed rare books, fine art, jewellery, and even oddments belonging to the once great and good, and perhaps some rather dubious sources too, but from the necessity of privacy in such messes, I will leave any further discourse to myself. Suffice to say, I live in a large, rambling 15th century timber frame Suffolk home, which affords me considerable space in which to hoard my collection. I think it pertinent at this point to mention that the house was once part of a rambling friary, which has a very large stone-lined cellar and an acre of laid-out gardens. It is to say the very least a picture-perfect home and some distance from the nearest town of Bury St Edmunds. Just after the end of the Second Great War against Germany and her allies, I was approached by a retired Brigadier General, of whom I will refer here to as David, who had acquired from the ruins of the Reich Chancellery in Berlin an artifact in the form of a strange wooden case mantel clock that was ticking without any external means for it to be wound or powered. The hand-painted face and brass garniture suggested an antique from the late 1700s. He then related to me how he came by it. I, as a senior British officer and being fluent in Russian and German, was sent to Berlin to verify the whereabouts of Hitler and some of his cohorts after the fall of Germany in 1945. The Russians had taken the city and had looted anything still standing which included the Reich Chancery buildings and grounds. Hitler, I was told, had committed suicide, and although his body had apparently been burnt before the Russians arrived, there remained no tangible proof of this, and was as such considered to be a missing war criminal at large. The clock had been found, according to this chap, a Russian lieutenant, in a strong room below in the Chancery bunker. Having no such use for this item, which initially appeared to be in a non-working state, he gratefully traded it in exchange for a bottle of whiskey and a pack of English cigarettes. He also gave a parchment document dated 1785 and written in German, which when translated claimed that the clock had once belonged to the Count of St. Germain, who apparently acquired it in London. The rest of the document was badly faded with age, but I was satisfied I had something of great rarity and curiosity, and I gratefully made the exchange. He continued, all of this understandably piqued my interest, as Saint Germain was a noted alchemist who lived from the late 1600s until his reported death in 1784. Anyway, I took the clock home with me in late 1946 and strangely found it was working independently of any power source and kept perfect time. The wooden case, as you will see, is completely sealed with no way of opening it without having to cause damage. He then inhaled and said, Anyway, I rechecked the accompanying document, which, under ultraviolet light, read much more clearly and revealed the following, of which I have translated for your benefit. He then produced a typewritten sheet of paper, which he handed to me. I put on my reading glasses, which David had translated thus. This clock was given to me as a personal special gift upon the deathbed of my friend, the Comte de Saint-Germain, for my support of his work in Eckenford. He claimed it was fabricated from special and hitherto unknown materials that would allow the owner to travel time itself, and that the entire piece had been sealed through a lost hermetic process. The letter continued, I have no use for such an item, and this clock is all I have saved from his estate. Signed, Charles of Hesse Castle, 1785. Placing my glasses on a Georgian side table, I asked what his thoughts were with regard to the letter's claims. He replied, Well, I can say the fact that it works independently without a key or power sources certainly alludes to the reputation of Saint-Germain. 
and the added testimonials of credible witnesses who have claimed that he never seemed to age over many, many years, and even appeared in more recent times, really seems to point out that this is being somewhat special and quite unique. I know from our chats in the past you have a fascination for such things, and the means to support it, and I therefore decided to offer it to you, old chap. First refusal, eh? He concluded. If you want the clock for prepayment approval, I can get it delivered to you by the morning of tomorrow. Of course I wanted it, and having agreed a rather princely sum for such a unique oddity, he left. As agreed, the clock did indeed arrive, and was delivered by David's gardener from the back of an Austin van, and inside a fairly largest wooden crate, which he handed to my butler, Jamison, who dutifully brought it to my library, and on my instruction placed it carefully on the polished wooden tiled floor. Excitedly, I opened the crate like a child on Christmas Day, and there, wrapped in sacking and buffered by cotton wool, was the described clock. Having carefully unpacked the item, I was in awe of the piece, which, as described, was hermetically sealed and built inside a burnished and French-polished rosewood case. Inscribed below the sealed Randall glass face was the words, Sit Dominus Caveat. Now, I accept I am no Latin scholar, but translated, it read something like, Let the owner beware. The brasswork looked neat and beautifully engraved, and the face bore hand-painted black Latin numerals on an enameled of china plate. And yes, no keyhole was observed, yet the piece was ticking and keeping perfect time. It was rectangular, measuring around 12 inches by 12 inches, and affixed to bracket feet. All in all, the clock was deeply fascinating. That day, I made a number of telephone calls to my contacts in the anti-clock world, and arranged for a professional photographer to attend the library and take a series of photographs, in order that, should it be necessary, I could forward by post these images for easier attribution. Having spoken to a number of experts, none were able to assist or corroborate the backstory attributed to Saint-Germain, and an early verbal description was of little help. Within a few days, the photos taken of the clock were posted to my contacts. All remarked how impossible it was for any clock to be self-powered, and wondered whether shaking the item actually helped to wind it up, as in a self-winding watch. Although, as they pointed out, such technology was unknown before 1920, and yet all were satisfied that the item belonged in the 18th century. One can imagine having something as unique as this in my collection. It was a huge buzz, but equally, it had so much mystery attached to it, notwithstanding its connection to Saint-Germain, if indeed that was his real name. It certainly attracted a great deal of interest. I had many offers to sell it to my contacts at double which I paid, but, you know, I was having nothing of it, and the strange inscription faded from memory weeks after I paid David in full for it. I felt there was nothing to fear here. Around a month later, about 2 p.m. in the afternoon, my butler, Jamison, having answered the entrance door to a caller, came to me as I sat in the drawing room with a business card on a platter. Jamison, by the way, has been in my employ since the early 1930s. He was a tall, former military officer who served with distinction in World War I, only to be badly wounded at the Somme, which left a slight limp. Even so, he kept his military bearing and demeanour, and was not only a reliable man to have around, but also a special friend. I trusted and respected him. He said, My apologies for disturbing you, sir, but there is a gentleman insistent upon seeing you over the antique clock. I wasn't really in any mood to chat with strangers, as my time and effort was absorbed by that clock, and yet it was eating away at me because my research was, quite frankly, not going anywhere. But I was equally curious to see who was calling, so I thanked Jamison and I took the card. The caller was apparently a Dr. Robert Dufresne, a professor of ancient history and with an affiliation to Cambridge University. As my inquiries were so stymied, I threw caution to the wind and asked that I receive him in my library where the actual clock stood, with pride of place on a 17th century Italian marble fire surround. When I arrived in the library, I saw what I presumed was the professor. 
a rather short but scruffy fellow wearing a three-quarter length stained navy crombie gentleman's coat and with fat grubby hands clutching a brown fur felt trilby hat and a rather bulging attache case. I also noted that he wore rather thick rimmed round spectacles and sported a goatee beard which partially concealed a pair of thick ruddy cheeks and his striped tie was pulled loosely from his equally grubby collar. Yes, he looked every inch an academic. He also had a certain look of urgency about him as he stood waiting and was fumbling with the handle of the attaché case and looking rather nervously at the clock in front of him. I walked over to him and invited him to sit with me at a mahogany reading table. Jamison instinctively pulled out a chair and beckoned him to sit. After much shuffling and placing his case on the carpet, he sat down rather uncomfortably and placed his hat on the table, of which Jamison removed to a coat hanger in the hallway. Once settled, I asked with a smile, How can I help you, Dr. Defrain? Briefly mumbling to himself, he looked at me rather anxiously and said, It's about that clock you have. A friend whom shall remain anonymous contacted me a few days ago to ask if I knew anything about it. You see, he was someone you contacted for advice and, well, I felt it pertinent if I called to see you in person. He stopped haltingly and said, Um, forgive me for not properly contacting you first by letter. I replied, please go on. I can see it perplexes you so. He quickly responded, I wouldn't say I'm perplexed, but it certainly is because of some concern that I travelled here at the first instant to speak to you. He intoned rather solemnly, That clock is an embodiment of evil. You can imagine my surprise. In fact, I was quite taken back by his comment and pressed him to explain himself better. Well, some thirty or so years ago, I knew the owner of that clock. He was like you, a wealthy collector. He had acquired it and a letter from the estate of a Julius Mendelssohn, who had disappeared without trace in 1914 from his home in Stockholm, Sweden. He claimed that this clock had the ability to travel time itself, and he also claimed to have travelled back to varying periods of history where he acquired great wealth and knowledge, and had actually met Saint-Germain himself. Before he continued, I gasped with incredulous surprise at the statements made by Dr. Dufresne. Rather excited at the prospect this clock may offer me, but equally fearful that this may be a hoax, I responded, Now listen here, old chap. I have been shared some amazing stories that accompany many purchases, but this is starting to sound quite absurd, to say the very least. I thought you might have some real history to share, and not this, sir. Uh, unproven fantasy. Have you any proof to back this up? Dufresne looked coldly into my eyes and replied, Let me continue. My friend also disappeared after owning that clock, and it somehow ended up in the collection of an SS officer who uh, apparently gifted it to Hitler in 1945. As you know, Hitler was involved in some rather dubious esoteric practices and um, more famously owned the Spear of Destiny, which allegedly pierced the side of Jesus as he hung on the cross during his crucifixion. He believed the spear would ultimately lead Germany to victory. Hitler, for reasons that were not disclosed to my sources, ordered for the clock to be locked away in a strong room, and I presume from there that is where you acquired it. Am I correct? Starting to take his story a little more seriously, I relaxed and replied, well, more or less, you are correct, with the exception that I bought it from a third party with a letter. Um, may I examine that clock? I want to show you something. With my permission, he brought the clock carefully to the reading table after I placed a large and heavy book beneath it to protect the surface. Having carefully placed it on top, he spent a minute or so checking the exterior. Presently, he exclaimed in a quiet voice, Ah! Oh, this is it. He twisted the left rear corner bracket or foot 180 degrees and hidden from behind the faceplate, another clock face slid upwards to reveal itself. I was amazed to see in such a compact clock this aperture. The face was gold with 13 runic symbols to denote each hour. And instead of two hands, there was one, the hour hand. 
the main face stopped and was replaced by the exact time on the other face hour hand. It was three o'clock and motioning slowly in sync from the other. Dufresne pointed out that the numeral three in runic script was pr, and it corresponded to an engraved P-like symbol. Pointing to the face, Dufresne said, The only number you have to concern yourself with is the 13, or in runic Breton. This is the hour of the dead, which will activate and transport anyone to a specific era of time. It is of no coincidence that the rune is shaped like one stem of a swastika, as it is to imagine like one facet of evil. My faith in Dufresne's knowledge was absolute, but the fear that crept through my body like tingling streaks of electricity was a foreboding that I was stepping into some dark chasm in time and history. Before I could continue further with Dufresne, Jamison entered the room with Elena, my housemaid. My apologies again, sir, for the intrusion, but it is time for your afternoon tea. I have taken the liberty to add an extra cup for Dr. Dufresne, if that's in accord with you. I replied, of course, would you like a cup, doctor? He replied disconcertingly, that is very kind, but I neither drink tea or coffee. Uh, but uh, please don't stop on my account. Elena, an attractive woman in her late thirties with a shock of long dark hair neatly tied in a bun, placed the tray on the table and proceeded to pour a cup of tea into a Minton service teacup and saucer. As she poured, she looked at Dufresne with a knowing suspicion and being momentarily distracted by him, overfilled the cup. Realising her clumsiness, she apologised and left the room with Jamison, who briefly poured more tea into the other cup before leaving with the overfill in his hands. Of course, I paid no further attention to this mishap, as I wanted to press him further on the clock's alleged properties. Well, he said, it was built in the 18th century by a clocksmith on the exact instructions of Saint-Germain, using metal and gold that he provided for the hidden face. I believe that these items were originally taken from the Ark of the Covenant, which disappeared in 597 BC. The Ark had imbued in it amazing powers which he harnessed and used for time travel. I learnt of this secret from someone who was apparently instructed by Saint-Germain. Saint-Germain claimed he existed in many forms and was an ascendant master who acquired eternal life from the Ark itself. He paused and continued, whether this is true or not, I do not know, but I do know that using this clock to travel time physically absorbs the user to the point that they will eventually cease to exist. It happened to my friend, and I have therefore deduced it to be de facto evil, and would urge you to relinquish ownership to me in order that I may be able to dispose of it. I assured Dufresne that I would not attempt to use it, but I had no intention of selling or giving over this clock into his possession. And in a way, this clock was rather special as it is, and with its strong esoteric connections, it fitted perfectly within my collection. Dufresne's face dropped into a large frown on hearing my decision, and stated he had to now leave. Having thanked him for imparting the information, Jamison escorted him from the house after he turned to me and said, You were warned by me, the rest is up to you. The coming days and nights left the restlessness in me. The clock, you see, would never leave my thoughts. Even in my sleep, I found myself in places I have never seen nor ever been, and the house acquired a feeling of ugliness about it, as the clock seemingly sat waiting on the fireplace, waiting for my next move. Perhaps Dufresne was right, but curiosity always got the better of me and I knew deep down I had to find out. One morning, whilst being served breakfast in the dining room by Elena, she asked whether she could speak to me briefly about Dr. Dufresne. Recalling her earlier interaction with him, I put down the morning newspaper and replied reassuringly, oh, Please, Elena, I'm interested. Do you know him? At my invitation, she sat down next to me and almost sighing said, My home country is Romania. It is an ancient place full of many myths, legends and stories. My people hold many of this to be true, but I'm perhaps, as you say, open-minded on such matters. 
but I'm sure I have seen this man before in Bucharest during World War II. She hesitated before continuing. He was in the German army as an attaché to the German embassy there. I believe he was an SS officer. Somewhat shocked, I inquired, how on earth do you know this? His English is impeccable. Elena looked briefly down at her hands before staring back to me to reply. I worked in that embassy as a translator for the Germans, and I saw this man daily during 1943 to 1944, and the weirdest thing is that he looks exactly the same age, and that was 10 years ago. Perhaps I'm wrong, or perhaps he has good genes, but nevertheless, he from memory was killed by the Russians in 1944. That I can say. You see, I had to flee Romania at that time because the Russians would have treated me as a collaborator. I'm not a Nazi, but the Germans were the allies of the Antonescu regime, and my employment by the Germans put food on my family table. Almost tearful, I consoled her and said, Is that why you are now living here? She replied, Yes, and I'm afraid to go back as the Russians still occupy Romania. I assured her that she was safe in my employ and asked, Can you recall his name? I mean to say, if he was an SS officer now here in England, he must be using an alias. She then stood up and replied, Forgive me, you are a kind and decent man, and I must return to work as your food is getting cold. I believe his name and title was Sturmbannführer von Kaisinger. He was a cultural attaché working with the Antonescu government on an archaeological project. I honestly know nothing further on this man, but I felt I should warn you. I was, of course, very grateful and assured her that what she shared with me was in the strictest of confidence. She seemed relieved and put on a reassured smile and left the room. After breakfast, I pondered on the developments raised by Eleanor. I rang an old school contact in Whitehall, London, who had access to records held in the National Archives. He rang back two days later, having retrieved some information which was related to me as following. There appeared to be an anomaly because the record stated that he was killed in action during the Russian invasion of Bucharest in 1944. Apparently, he was an officer commanding a detachment of SS troops belonging to the Ukrainian Galician Division. His body, though, was never recovered, and another snippet of information gleaned from prisoners taken from Hitler's bunker in May 1945 states that he disappeared shortly after Hitler's suicide and that he spent the last hours with him in secret. Of course, at this stage, Hitler's death could not be confirmed because no body or tangible proof and no trace of von Kiesinger was found. And all that was known of him was that he reportedly howled from Dusseldorf in Germany. Having requested the address from that city, I thanked him for his cooperation, which of course created more questions than answers. Over the next few weeks, I engaged the services of a reputable London private detective named Wilfred Jones, an ex-detective with the Metropolitan Police. All of the information I had to share was a visual description of the mysterious Dr. Dufresne, plus the scant information on his business card. Jones dutifully reported a few weeks later that the address details on the card and the telephone number which related to Bloomsbury in London was false, and Cambridge University had no record of him whatsoever. Also, I engaged a firm of Dusseldorf detectives in Germany to trace what happened to von Kaisinger. But his confirmed pre-war address in that city had long since disappeared under World War II rubble, and former neighbours that still lived in the city had never heard of him. They even attempted to trace a birth certificate, and again there wasn't any record of him, whether alive or dead. It was almost that von Kaisinger never existed. Whoever he was, I was satisfied. His name wasn't von Kaisinger or Dufresne. The clock was the only tangible item I had, and I concluded that the clock might be the only clue in solving this riddle. I mentioned earlier that the house felt uncomfortably ugly, in a way that I couldn't quite put my finger on. For all intents and purpose, life went on as normal but from the library where the clock stood, it felt cold and dead. Almost like the clock on the mantelpiece was like a headstone on the grave, and I fearfully contemplated for whom. Over the next few weeks, nothing more was heard on Dufresne or von Kaisinger, or indeed anything relating to that clock. 
The library had now an aura that was incredibly depressing and, and actually colder to the degree that the room felt like it was a freezer. In fact, I spent very little time in there and avoided it if I could. At night, staff complained of hearing movement inside that room and on one occasion, they were certain it was somebody walking in there. But nothing, absolutely nothing, was found on investigation. Elena, my maid, also complained of the room's atmosphere, as it was her duty to clean and dust. I decided, therefore, to make the library off-limits to everyone, as I was fearful of what might happen next. It was like a brooding monster sat in that room, waiting patiently to pounce. There was something definitely evil about that clock, but its allure was slowly sucking me in. I therefore hatched a plan. Within my esoteric collection, I had an ancient Egyptian Middle Kingdom amulet engraved with the Eye of Horus. I figured not unreasonably that the Ark of the Covenant and Horus were in period with each other, and that the symbiology of the amulet's powers would protect me from any evil, whether imagined or real. Yes, I was clutching at straws. Within this plan, I engaged my faithful butler, Jamison, who was prepared to help me in the event that should I enact the 13th hour on the clock, he would hold a rope tied to me that could be utilised in such a manner to pull me from the presumed generated void that I will enter by yanking the rope hard to effect my extraction from whatever I will face. It was not perfect and was foolhardy, but I knew from a deep gnawing sensation in my gut that this was the only way, and perhaps subconsciously I was wanting to do this. The following night, I gave Elena and my other domestic staff the evening off while Jamison and myself prepared the clock and the equipment I felt might be necessary to engage whatever lies ahead. For this, I wore the amulet of Horus on my right arm for self-protection and equipped myself with a loaded Webley revolver and a flashlight. I also carried with me sufficient spare rounds of ammunition and a small Bible and as an afterthought, a small flask of holy water. All of the above was carried in a canvas holder which I would carry. I really didn't know quite what I was about to expect, and perhaps to some, they might feel I was acting rather hasty, and perhaps extreme in my efforts. The clock was prepared by following Dufresne's guidance, and once the hidden face was exposed, it was placed on top of a large and quite stable mahogany plant stand. The hour was midnight, and we had all but one hour to wait. The minutes passed with an increasing tenseness which felt heavier, for each minute the heavy hand moved slowly towards the thirteenth hour. I had carefully prepared for this event, so momentous that I was barely able to contain the fear and the excitement of what may happen. Jamison too felt tense, but as a loyal friend and companion, he remained stoical and positive in what would be a moment of truth. In what seemed like moments, the hour hand very soon came upon me. Jamison carried out some last minute tests to make sure the safety harness I wore was tethered securely to a rope which was firmly anchored to a wrought iron library step. The salient fact was that of course we didn't know what to expect and in all truth I was starting to get cold feet. The moment soon arrived and I heard a loud clanging sound from the clock which struck what seemed to be a loud bell which nothing. The thirteenth hour struck and nothing happened at all. I turned to Jamison but he was not to be seen and the rope tied to him remained from me slack and empty on the floor. Just as I thought it was all a hoax and that Jamison had somehow decided to opt out I heard a voice. It was that of Dufresne. I looked across the gloom of the library and saw not Dufresne but a man dressed replete in 18th century costume who wore a powdered wig, a white frilled shirt, a three-quarter length yellow over jacket with a light blue waistcoat underneath. He had matching blue breeches with light coloured socks and leather court shoes. The very image of a dandy. He rested with one hand on a silver top walking cane whilst the other outstretched to the side and then proceeded to bow. After bowing and smiling, he raised his body to an erect posture and said, Pleased to make your acquaintance once again, dear sir, for you're not in your library, but in a facsimile world of my own creation. And where would that be? I retorted. 
Why, dear sir, you are but one facet of my multiverse that stretches through time and across many geographies. I exist in many periods and as a multitude of persons, and here I am as the Comte de Saint-Germain, and it is as he that I have built my device for which you are now here with me. Am I dead? I replied. Like me, you are neither dead nor are you alive. You exist within a fold in time, and you are my guest. Your body remains frozen in time at the moment you join me. You could be here 100 years, but should you be returned, it will be nothing more than a millisecond of time that has passed. So who or what are you? I inquired. He laughed. <laughs> Well, in your world, as indeed in many others, I exist as a solid corporeal entity, and that is to say, being within the body of a living host. I have always existed, that I know, but should I never have another host, I will be as I am now, as a spiritual ghostly entity who has walked into the realm of the dead, and yes, there are many like me here. And can I presume that the body of Dufresne is that of someone you have taken? Why, he smiled, of course yes, and you volunteered yourself to be next. I shuddered and retorted, how did I do that? People that enter my world do so as a result of being warned not to operate the 13th hour face. That clock is evil because I am the essence of that evil, but sometimes the opposite is a force for good. And yet you came willingly into my realm, so you have for all intent and purpose surrendered yourself to me. He continued. Hitler, for example, was a delicious evil that I wanted purely as energy to recharge the clock. His body was never found, and should you have discovered the secret of the clock, you would have found that there was no discernible mechanism. It is his soul and absorbed flesh that he and others have willingly donated that allows me to exist. Hitler wanted an easy escape from his bunker, and I provided the solution that he so readily took. Others such as yourself are host bodies, and I will continue as you with your mind and thought processes and history firmly intact to allow me to exist in this time until I find another host. Be happy that with me your body will never age. Dufresne sadly hasn't much use left for me, so you can appreciate the urgency of my situation, can't you? And in return I have a superior knowledge of history and the litany of skills and attributes that I have occasionally endowed with your kind, so the exchange is sometimes beneficial, is it not? Oh, and by the way, I'm flattered that you wear the Amulet of Horus, because in that cult and in that period, I was a high priest. Not quite as you thought, eh? He continued in a matter-of-fact manner and said, Anyway, there's nothing more you can do, and now I need to return back as you. I realized the pistol would have no impact, but I guess that despite the apparent slack rope, I was still tethered to Jamison in my own time, and so I pulled hard and incredibly hard as he walked towards me, and I fell back over. Lying on the floor, I looked up now to see Jamison looking very concerned over me. You were pulling at the rope, and yet you were still here in the room, sir. Regardless, I pulled back as instructed, and here you are. Nothing happened at all. Yet you are shaking terribly, sir. Can I get you a brandy or similar? Relieved, I smiled and asked that he assist me quickly to my feet, whereupon we retreated to a safe distance back from the clock, where I fired the entire chamber from my pistol into the case. As each bullet struck it, a shaft of white light beamed from the apertures, in all, six shafts of light, each beaming a multitude of ethereal human faces in white ghostly forms, which thickened into a heavy mist, and then took on the appearance of numerous human forms, including that of the Comte de Saint-Germain. The shrieking and the accompanying voices amplified to such a degree that I could stand the sounds no more, and at that moment the clock and its unearthly parade shrunk into a small white hole and disappeared for good. It was over. I remembered no more. Just after the end of the Second Great War against Germany and her allies, I was approached by a retired Brigadier General, of whom I refer to here as David, who had acquired from the ruins of the Reich Chancery in Berlin an artifact in the form of a strange wooden case mantle clock. The End <laughs>